Hi, everybody. So welcome to GopherCon the 5th. Let's give a big round of applause to the organizers, the staff, and all of you attendees for making it five awesome years of GopherCon. So um, I am dead program. Um, in the real world, I'm Ron Evans. Occasionally, I'm dad, but uh, I'm dead program on Twitter, GitHub, Facebook, all of the internets type places. And I am the ringleader of the hybrid group. We're a boutique consultancy that we do hardware for software companies, a few companies, or software for hardware companies, rather, companies like Intel and a small company called Sphero out of Boulder, Colorado, known for some robots in movies about wars in the stars, and that's all I'm allowed to say based on those agreements. So let's move on to some of our open source projects, the best known of which is GoBot, which we introduced to the Go community five years ago at the first GopherCon, and the most recent introduction, GoCV. So GoCV is an open source project that lets you use OpenCV from the Go programming language. So OpenCV, it also lets you use OpenVINO from Intel, which is like a special, customized, hardware-accelerated version of OpenCV. So one is computer vision, you may wonder. Well, I'm going to answer that question, of course. So computer vision can detect motion. It can recognize people from their faces or other physical attributes. Telepresence, which is when you are able to see things in a remote location, not psychic powers, but video streaming. Autonomous vehicles, planes, trains, automobiles, and of course, my personal favorite, multicopters and augmented humans. And when we say augmented humans, we're not just talking about what Tim O'Reilly said of the Internet of Things is designed to give humans superpowers, but it can also be important things like giving medical professionals the ability to better read a radiology report in ways that the regular unaugmented human eye cannot discern. So why you should use Go for computer vision? Well, it's of course for the same reasons you should use Go for everything. The concurrency, come for the concurrency and stay for the portability, and the performance. The Go programming team has done amazing work over the last year and two years at improving and making really remarkable performance. So uh, Go is really great for those reasons. So how Go CV works, which is the Go wrapper around OpenCV, so we use Go to talk to C Go to talk to C, to talk to C++. Now, that, that sounds kind of complex, and, but luckily we've done all of the work for you so that your Go application is just written in regular, ordinary Go. It talks to the Go CV Go wrappers, which then talk to the Go CV C binding, which talk to OpenCV itself, which is actually written in C++. So OpenCV has literally hundreds of computer vision algorithms and filters. I mean, it's the result of, I think, 10 or 12 years of hundreds of different computer vision researchers. So we, this gives us the ability to use that from within our favorite programming language. So you can use it from Linux, of course. You can use it from Mac OS. And you can use the exact same Go code for computer vision from Windows. Yes, I said Windows. So uh, a lot of people in the world use Windows. You may not be one of them, but we should care about them because they are technologists like ourselves and we want to empower them to use the same tools that we use. So let's take a quick look at the hello world of video. We've all seen the hello world of Go. So here's a little tiny bit of code. So we start with our package main, the same as we do with any Go program. We're going to import GoCV from the gocv.io x namespace. And then our main function, we're going to call gocv.videocapture device, and we're going to say zero. So that's going to open camera zero. We're going to say gocv.new window, hello. That's going to open a window so we can see what the camera sees. And then we're going to say image equals gocv.new mat. So that's going to create an image matrix for us to put the image into. We'll talk about the matrix in a minute. So then for infinitely, we're going to webcam.read into that image. So we're going to read the webcams, whatever it sees, put it in the image. We're going to window.imshow, so we put the image into the window so we can see what it sees. 
And then we're going to call gocv.waitkey for one millisecond to give us a chance to interrupt the program. So if the demo gods are good, which can sometimes happen, so there I am in all of my glory, the hello world. Hello world. All right, so let's get into some good stuff. Into the matrix. So the fundamental unit of data that you manipulate when using OpenCV and consequently GoCV is what's known as the mat, which is short for the matrix. So an empty mat is just like an empty Lego tile. It's got nothing on it. It's somewhat like the matrix that you would use in a mathematical calculation with rows and columns, but in this case, it has no actual values whatsoever. It's just a blank slate upon which we can put data. So here's an example of a grayscale image. It's a mat that's got two dimensions. It's got an X and a Y dimension. And each one of its values is going to be a 16-bit integer. That way, we can maintain the different levels of gray. So here's a grayscale image as we would main represent it in a mat. So an RGB color image would be a mat of two dimensions, again, an X and a Y dimension, also of 16-bit integer values. But in this case, it would have three channels, one channel for red, one channel for green, and one channel for blue. And if you've ever done any photo editing software, you've seen this, or, or graphics, or used the image package within Go, you've seen this sort of representation of image data before. We can also use MAT to represent other kinds of data. In this case, it's a 3D vector. So it's a MAT with three dimensions. Each one of the elements is a floating point, and we have two channels perhaps an X and a Y. So this might be a way that we could represent a three-dimensional point cloud that we've obtained by doing some image analysis of video and maintain that same information in the form of a mat. So mats are very powerful. So let's take a quick look at four different tiny applications all written using GoCV, which are basically the typical applications that you're going to need to solve with computer vision. So the first one is face tracking. Well. You know, I don't really like face tracking anymore. Face tracking isn't really cool anymore, is it? I mean, what about things about privacy and our individual security? I'll tell you what's cool, it's face blurring. That's what's cool. So the way we're going to do that is first we have to actually track the face to blur it. So we're going to use something that's called a cascade classifier. So a cascade classifier uses something that's known as Haar wavelets. It basically allows us to distinguish any particular uh, curve or image in the form of four different dimensional characteristics. And by analyzing those four, we can say yes or no, it matches. This is an example of the four different classification categories. And so here's my son, Manolo, with those applied, the hard feature applied to his eyes. So we could recognize, yes, there's, there's Manolo with his eyes. Here's the same idea, but applied to his nose. You know, the nose is a little lighter than the cheeks are darker, so we can recognize these characteristics of an image and use this to identify a person. Or we could just use the gocv.cascade classifier. That's a lot easier, because we built that functionality for you based on OpenCV. So here, let's take a quick look at just some of this code. So we have some standard packages, Funt, Image, OS, and StirConv, and then gocv. We are going to read in just some command line parameters so that we can figure out which camera to use, because I'm going to use my, um, my better camera here. And then we open the webcam, same as the Hello World example. We open the window to display the information, same as the Hello World example. We open an image matrix, same as the Hello World example. Then we are going to use gocv.new cascade classifier to create the cascade classifier class that we're going to then use to analyze the images. And then we load that with the training set of data. So then we repeat endlessly. We read image in from the webcam, same as the hello world. And now the thing that we do here is we call the classifiers detect multi-scale, passing in that image. This goes and it's going to return to us a slice of rectangles that contain each of the faces that we've identified. So then for each face that we found, we're going to pull its region within the mat, you know, which part of it is, we don't want to blur the whole image, just the faces. And then we're going to do a Gaussian blur, which is a kind of blurring function, to blur the face. We're going to clean up our, after ourselves, because this is still GoCV, and we need to clean up our memory after ourselves. 
and then we're going to show that image. So let's take a look and see if the gods are crazy or if they let me run a demo. All right. So I'll stand back. So can I get the house lights up for a minute? Can we get the house lights up? See, this allows you to claim you were never there. It's kind of glary. Some of you weren't there. Some of you were. Yeah, you ones in the front row weren't really here. <laughs> now, you'll notice that it's only able to recognize some of the people. If you turn your head too far to the other direction, the Cascade classifier is not able to classify. So that's one of the weaknesses of this technique. Also, the more classifications that you want to do, the more processing time that it takes. So it has its advantages as far as tr traditional computer vision, but it also has certain disadvantages. So let's take a look at the next demonstration. Motion detection and tracking. So this is a really common type. I want to you know, create a web application that shows me when the neighbor's cat is stealing my dog's food or the neighbor's dog is stealing my cat's food or whatever that happens to be. So the way we're going to do that is using something called background subtraction. So background subtraction uses something called a mixture of Gaussian. So if you remember from those classes in school you were supposed to pay attention in, the Gaussian is a normalized distribution like the bell curve. So we were able to analyze these different R, G, and B values, the red, green, and blue values for each pixel of an image, figuring out what the normalized distribution for each of them is, something that's known as a mixture of Gaussians. So then if we go through the image and for each one of these pixels we do a running mixture of Gaussians, we can figure out what's in the foreground that's moving and what's in the background that's unchanging. And this is a great way for us to be able to detect motion. Or we can just call subtractor mog 2 That's a much easier way to do it. So let's take a quick look at some code. It's very similar to the code we saw before. It's basically the same design pattern for most computer vision applications. We open up our captured device so that we're getting the video that we need. We open up a window or someplace to show it. In this case, we're going to open a few mats, one to hold the image, one to hold the image delta, which is the changed part, not the background, but the part that's changing, an image threshold, which was one of the filters we're going to use to clean up that part of the foreground to figure out what's moving. So then also we need to create the algorithm by calling gocv.newBackgroundSubtractor mod 2. That's a mixture of Gaussian 2. It's a more efficient mixture of Gaussian than the 1, I suppose. All right, so then same exact pattern as before. We keep repeating forever. We read the webcam. We're going to apply the algorithm to that image that we read in from the camera and put the output into the delta. So that's just the changing part. So we'll, we'll do a little bit of cleanup. We'll use GoCV threshold, so it's only the things that are a strong enough signal, if you will, in the image. We'll call dilate, which basically fills in all the rough edges. Dilate kind of spreads out to fill in the gaps. And then we'll find the contours in that image of what it is that's actually moving. And then we'll draw those contours out so that we can see the part that's moving and then draw a rectangle around it as well. And then we'll put a little bit of text on there to say when we've detected it and show it. So let's go ahead and run this. Let's see if I can hold still long enough. There's a lot of movement here. There's still a lot of movement. The pixels are crawling. There we go. Wow, that's a really cool effect. <laughs> that's not computer vision. That's like real vision. <laughs> wow, I really like that. Oh, God, that's awesome. Is this being recorded? I hope so, man. <laughs> All right. So there's motion detection using Go OpenCV and GoCV. All right. How are we doing on time? Oh, we're doing awesome. Man, I can talk a little slower. All right. So motion JPEG streaming. So uh, if you do a search on you know, Google or other search engines that have autocomplete, and you type, how do I open CV, like once you get past install, uh, you know, and the, one of the next one is, how do I get my webcam to stream on the internet? So it turns out that there's already a format for decoding video in your browser that's already built into every browser. It's called Motion JPEG or MJPEG. 
So what we're gonna do is we're going to use GoCV to, do some to take what is in the camera and stream it onto a web page. So we're gonna use a slightly different pattern than what we used before. So we still have some standard packages. We're going to use the hybrid group MJPEG package, which is a fork of, uh, I forgot the original author, but he disappeared a couple of years ago, so no, we're stuck maintaining it now, I guess. Um, contributions accepted. So, and then we're gonna use GoCV. So we'll declare our variables outside. We've got our device ID for which camera we're gonna use. We've got our webcam as a pointer to the gocv.video capture. So this way we can actually call it from different functions within our program. We don't have to have everything just in one big main routine, but we can have slightly better program encapsulation of the different functionalities. And then we're going to have our stream, which is a pointer to the mjpeg.stream which is what represents our actual MJPEG stream for when we serve it up on our HTTP server. So our main function, we're going to open the video capture device, again, same as before. This time we're going to create a new mjpeg.newStream, uh, MJPEG which creates our stream for us, and we'll start a new Go routine to start capturing. Then we'll start an HTTP server that's going to listen on its root and serve up that stream, and then we just use Go's normal standard library, HTTP, listen and serve. So this is just your regular, everyday Go web server that's gonna serve up this streaming image. So then last, here's our Go routine, that capture routine that we call here. So all it does is it creates a new mat that we're gonna store the image in. We read from the camera, and then we encode that image into the JPEG format because motion JPEG is just JPEG, one after another, so that it makes a moving picture, like a cartoon. And then we'll call stream.updateJPEG, passing in that buffer of bytes. So that tells, this is the new frame of data, so whatever web clients that we have, this is what we should serve up to them to, for their browser to see. All right, so let's see it work. So we're capturing, we can point your browser to um, the local host 8080. So let's bring up another tab, local host 8080. And there I am in the web browser, hello. Streaming web video. And you can see that we're connected, we're getting our normal HTTP log. So if I close the window, we disconnected. So, I mean, it's nothing more than your standard libraries, HTTP server, and we're taking advantage of that to serve up. So you could have your regular web app on your robotic device that has its own built-in streaming video server. That way you can fly your drone from your web browser. Whether or not that's a good idea, I leave up to you. All right. So now our fourth demonstration, object classification and tracking. With a deep neural network and a drone. Drum roll, please. You guys are good, really good. Okay, that's enough drum rolling. <laughs> All right, so for this, we're gonna use the DJI Tello. So let's um, take a quick look at it, like literally take a look at it. So the Tello drone is a uh, really cool drone um, made by DJI, the awesome Chinese drone company. It is a very inexpensive drone. It's only $99 US, but it has very sophisticated capabilities built into it that we normally associate with quite expensive drones. A lot of that is because it has built into it a chip that's known as the Intel Movidius Myriad 2. It's a chip that's specifically for doing deep neural no network processing in silicon with hardware acceleration. So Tello uses that particular chip to do both deep neural network processing as well as being able to do all the drone flight controls and stuff. So um, let's take a quick look here. Turn that off. I, don't, I have um, a bunch of those Movidius chips, but I forgot it off stage, so that's okay. So let's take a quick look at, uh, it's also gonna use a deep neural network that's been trained using CAFE. CAFE is a framework for creating deep neural networks that has come out of the University of California, Berkeley. It's a very excellent tool. It's very commonly used for these types of applications. 
So what is a deep neural network? So a neural network is an attempt to create an artificial neural network, rather, is an attempt to create a program that operates in a similar fashion conceptually to the way that a synapse in the human brain operates. It's not really the same exact thing because it's not a biochemical or electrochemical process. It's a simulation of the way that these synapses work. So it's not really exactly the same thing. But it's very useful because we can solve certain categories of problems that are very hard to solve through traditional algorithmic types of approaches. So a deep neural network is, is really a, a neural network where you have the inputs and the outputs with some type of hidden nodes in between, where there's some nodes in between that receive these inputs and then translate them to the output node, so there's an indirection in between. And that's really what, when you hear deep neural network, it means that there's multiple layers of hidden nodes. So we're going to use OpenCV's face tracking SSD model, which is an SSD model is what's a single shot multi-box detector. It's a kind of model where you basically takes a look at all of the pieces of the image, tries to put them through the neural network. If it doesn't find any positives, in other words, if it has negative matches, then it knows there's no people in the picture and we don't have to keep looking. One of the advantages of that type of technique is that it's much more efficient. It doesn't matter how many people are in the image, it takes the same amount of computation. And also, it can be trained on different people with the same exact result. It doesn't have to only be trained to the people it will specifically recognize. And lastly, it's a lot better at recognizing the sides of people's faces. You don't have to look at it really you know, straight head on. So I'm going to ask for my good friend Mark Bates to come on stage. Uh, many of you, give a big hand for Mark. He, he's a really great target, I mean subject, I mean participant in my demos. So uh, we're going to do all this stuff with the gocv.net class. And so we don't have time to go over all this code. But uh, the quick version is we're going to be using GoBot to control the drone and GoCV to do the video processing. So we're going to then also be using FFmpeg, which is a decoding software, because the video that's put out by the Tello is H.264 encoded video. So we're going to decode that video using FFmpeg, and then we're going to track it. Basically, whenever we get a video frame, we're going to pass that to FFmpeg when we get a video frame from the drone. And then when we get that frame, we're going to take it, we're going to put it into a mat that we, we can process it in GoCV, and then we're going to try to track face. And track face, the way that it works is we're going to take that image, convert it into the 4D vector that's needed for the deep neural network to process it. We're going to pass that information for the image into the neural network. And then we're going to perform a forward pass, which then runs through the net network and gets the results. Then based on those results, we're going to take a look. And for each one of the faces, we're going to decide whether it, where it's located, left, top, right, bottom. Calculate that, and then based on that, we'll navigate the drone around. We'll actually change the drone's positioning based on the X, Y, and Z axis of the face. And then we'll use our joystick to fly it around, hopefully, if all goes well. All right. Are you ready, Mark? No, it never works. <laughs> it never works the first time, but it works like the fifth or the eighth time ish. All right. So let's. All right, this looks like the code. Yes, that looks about right. The drone, oh wait, we have to connect to the, uh, to the drone's Wi-Fi. That would also be very helpful. That could be kind of anticlimactic. I hate when drones just fly off by themselves and attack people. I only like when they do it on command. All right. No, it hasn't gone rogue yet. I still have another minute. All right, so I'm going to take the joystick in my hand. I'm going to hit the button to, oh, I'll put the joystick down for a minute. All right, we're connected. So we should see in a brief moment, yes, there's the video coming from the drone. Let's open it up. Hello, everybody. So let's hit the, let's hit the launch button. All right, so that, the drone is now flying. Oh, hey, it's Mark. So I'm going to turn on the face tracker. So now it should follow him around. You can get closer. It should move away from you. Yeah, it should. It did it in reverse. <laughs> Look, it's coming closer. 
Your hair and makeup is really good, Mark. All right. Oh, no, it's coming back. Oh, it's, now it's going to come after me. We're going to train the next neural network to be a Mark Bates, not Mark Bates detector. Okay, now you should do the close of the demo. All right, fine. All right, well, I think Mark has is, is made friends with the drone, so I'm going to turn off the face tracking, and I'm going to... Let's turn on the landing mode. Mark, I think it likes you. All right. Thanks, Mark. So that's GoCV, gocv.io. Check it out. We encourage you to participate in the creation of this open source software. Also, I want to remind everybody, Thursday is Community Day. Hopefully, a bunch of you are sticking around. This year, we're going to have the GopherCon Hardware Hack Session. We've done that the last few years. We have Thursday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m in uh, one of the main rooms. We have lots of hardware from our wonderful sponsors. We're going to have Go for Car, which is autonomous, Go-powered race cars racing on the track. We're going to have the Go for Drone Flight Zone, where you can actually try out uh, drones just like this Tello. We've got a bunch of Tellos, or a few Tellos, that you can try out yourselves. Special guest, Misty One, yes, from Boulder, Colorado. My dear friends from Misty Robotics are going to be coming with a couple of prototypes of the Misty One for you guys to try out. And so you shouldn't miss it. So one last thought. So humanity is acquiring all the right technology for all the wrong reasons. That's a quote from Bucky Fuller, Buckminster Fuller, an author, futurist, and inventor. He wrote a great book in the 70s called Utopia or Oblivion, The Prospects for Humanity. And one of the things that Bucky Feller was really very far ahead of many of his contemporaries and even of many of, of us in modern times was to realize the interconnectedness of the economic systems, of the political systems, of the information systems, of all of the distant systems that existed within our entire human species, and that really we only had one choice, utopia or oblivion. So the thought I leave you with is, what kind of future do we want to create with our technology? Do we want to create a technology where we've depleted our resources, using up all of them before we're able to actually achieve our dreams, leaving them abandoned? Do we want to use our technology as a tool of oppression and control, where we're taking away people's freedoms? Or perhaps, do we want to use our technology as tools of liberation and of progress? Well, the battle for the future began in the past, and so the choices we make today determine the outcome that we're going to have. Please choose wisely. Thank you. <laughs>